Welcome to the One World Government Podcast Hour, broadcasting live from the open desert, just south of Goldfield Ghost Town in the legendary Superstition Mountains of Arizona. The show will concentrate on conspiracies, the paranormal, UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, and of course, music. So come on in and pull up a chair, pour your favorite beverage, and enjoy the hour. With my colleague, James Linton, we're gonna dive headfirst into these topics with our very special guests. My name is Paul Barrett, and you're listening to the One World Government Podcast Hour. And welcome, welcome again. This is Paul Barrett, and we are live here in the Arizona desert. We're out here with the dogs tonight, around the open fire near the base of the mountain, enjoying the stars in the sky, Arizona's beautiful sky. Oh, wait a second, I see a chemtrail. Hang on a minute. But we got another great show lined up again tonight. The hits keep coming. We got an author, a radio show, a host, I guess we could say, podcast host, and also a great uh, public speaker. And he has written two incredible books. His first book is The Illusion of Us, and his new book, The Stage of Time, and I'm going to say it right now, it's the best book I've read in 2019. He really nails it on the head with his research, going all the way back to ancient civilizations, dating well back 30,000 years B.C. And it's a real pleasure to have on the show here tonight, Mr. Matthew LaCroix. Matt, are you with us? I'm here. It's great to be here. Thanks. All right. Excellent. And then, Matt, uh, before we get get going in this I just I was trying to I know Jim's going to have a lot of questions I'm going to have some questions looking at the stage of time the timeline of these ancient civilizations I'm looking at was it the Mesopotamian uh, then the Egyptians then the Sumerians then the Babylonians then the Greeks and Romans something like that yeah it's complicated though because when we look at something like um, the Mesopotamian area, there was, um, the cuneiform tablets and evidence actually points to the fact there may have been multiple different stages of civilizations in that area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, and uh, the longest running one, would you was that the Egyptians, would you say? They and again, did. yeah, that's a little bit of a, a, an area we'd have, we'd have to discuss because Egypt just, what we'll get into um, as we talk about this tonight, but Egypt is another one of those locations that has two different distinct, at least two different distinct time periods. Um, oh, okay. The dynastic pharaoh period, which is the newer period, and then a much older period, which is connected to when the pyramids were essentially created. Gotcha, gotcha. And have you, you have been out to the pyramids, I believe, right? It's it's, um, it's one of the number one things on my bucket list that I'm okay. absolutely dying to get out there. It's one of the few things I haven't, you know, it's really at the, the top of the list, basically. Yeah, and I, I heard the show with you and Billy uh, Carson that you did on YouTube, and that was, I think it was Forbidden Knowledge. And, man, what fabulous, uh, fabulous show you guys did. How do you like working with Billy? Billy's great. You know, Billy and I both released our latest books uh, rather at, around the same time, and we had a lot of the same content. Um so we both decided to collaborate and do some shows together and try to promote each other's work because in the end we're both um we're both on the same side in terms of trying to allow this you know forget um this forbidden truth this knowledge that exists from far back in the day that has been largely suppressed we're working together with many others around around the world to try to get this out to the public so people know about this lost history that preceded us yeah, yeah. Okay. So for the listeners who are listening to the show tonight, if you can give us a like a brief synopsis of the stage of time, uh what why you wrote the book and what's actually covered in that book. Okay, thanks. Uh well first of all I wanna say I appreciate your kind words um you said about it. Um that's you know, that's a great feat for someone to be able to say that. It's it's a great honor. Um the stage of time for me was 
the project that I had been leading up to um, throughout all the years of my work. You know, I wrote The Illusion of Us, but then I really realized that there was these large holes that remained unanswered, that I hadn't answered in The Illusion of Us or expanded on. And The Stage of Time, to me, was not only a book where I attempted to answer those difficult questions, but I really felt um, compelled to include as many of these ancient cuneiform writings, Gnostic writings, um, any of these ancient writings that really portray the past and give us these clues about what really happened. And so I wanted to include as many of them as I could in the book so that people had a place they could go to read some of these ancient cuneiform tablets like the Atrahasis and the Enuma Elish and the Legend of Atanya. These Atanya has basically these secrets that were remain within them, hidden beneath, you know, layers of symbolism and these these metaphorical stories to try to have us understand what happened in the past. But within those stories are these little nuggets of truth, I, I like to call them, that, you know, things like mentioning a certain city and when it was when it was when it existed, who ruled in it. Those are these little tidbits that are allowing us to piece together this forgotten chapter of human history, explaining so much of what happened before were essentially told. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Jim. No, I, I, I'm fascinated with uh, ancient history, um, and I'm a big fan of Randall Carlson. So I, I know that. Uh, but more on the, I think his, his uh, the numerical systems that are embedded within ancient texts. It's always been something fascinating. Um, as a result, I think I've got a bit of a gap in what you focused on in your book about. I would say more easily documented or verifiable recent history compared to I think he was trying to get into more of like cataclysms that annihilated all of our uh, all the information of our deep past but you've done a pretty good job of getting into um, some of the underlying traditions that might reveal more about them within more recent texts including not just those uh, those, those near eastern traditions but I think you touched on the stuff that's even within the bible and things like that so that was it was really cool that in that regard do you think um I know you're, you were talking about consciousness. I said I don't want to go over there yet because we're on this topic with ancient history. How do you, um, what do you think is, like, if you could encapsulate what you think you're revealing in this, in this book that tells us more about the, lo- the, the really lost past, like the stuff that I would say Carlson uh, maybe um, focuses on more than, than and you're focusing on stuff that's a little more, I, I know it's hard to say recent, if you're talking about 12, you know, 12,900, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, actually, Randall Car- Carlson and um, researchers like Brian Forrester and Graham Hancock have been huge inspirations behind my work. And I don't just come from this, from just looking at the symbolism and the ancient text and trying to piece that piece that together, I also really incorporate a lot of their work and a lot of the work that's gone into, okay, well, let's try to figure out to correlate these ancient stories with evidence like ice core samples and geologic samples. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they have really spearheaded that whole, that whole search. And I, it's inspired me to include a lot of that information that I've heavily studied as well. When you say something like, well, look at how gr- the Greenland ice cap has been around for potentially longer than any ice cap we know on the planet besides Antarctica. And therefore, it, it's like a time capsule, giving us this yep. glimpse of the past and all of these events that occur. And so in this stage of time, um, not only do I include those aspects, but I really do talk a fair amount about those disasters and about these, what led to all of these ancient texts and all these ancient, uh, this ancient wisdom to be destroyed and lost. And so I try to come at this from every angle possible, explaining the nature of reality, explaining consciousness, explaining megalithic building, the precision behind how they built these incredible structures, energy, We're looking at um, the control of things like certain symbols carried throughout history and how those impacted the rise and fall of empires and past civilizations. I try to look at this from a holistic viewpoint to try to, it's not like I'm uncovering something that's never been done, but I'm taking pieces from the whole perspective of, of, of everything and trying to put them together so we can say, okay, so this is what the evidence is showing us to explain what happened to these civilizations. And more importantly, not only what happened to them, but what, what, did, what did they know? What, what, what did they leave behind? 
to tell us about how sophisticated they were, what you know, what kind of writings did they leave behind to explain these very strange origin stories that seem to occur, you know, long before human history has ever even been established, according to the mainstream academics. So I, you know, I don't, Randall Carson and Graham Hancock and a lot of these other guys, they do fantastic work in the fields that they, that they do. But one area they really don't delve is this forbidden aspect of these cuneiform tablets, these Vedic texts these areas that go into these ancient gods and this wisdom that was handed down and the influences of certain gods and symbols all around the world, I feel that that's the area that I said, okay, I want to expand on this and I want to take all that other data and try to combine it to try to come up with this plausible understanding of, of really what's been going on throughout history, throughout the past. Yeah, and, and let's, let's just stay on this for a little bit because uh, our, our last album that Jim and I released uh, – was the title was Signs and Symbols of the album. And the new album we're currently recording and working on, uh, the working title is Eagles and Serpents. Okay. Oh, wow. Isn't that great? Did you guys come up with that on your own? Was that I something did. you, you yeah. just... Okay. I've been studying the theory of eagles and serpents for about maybe a couple of years now. And where I'm at is, was the origin of all these flags that you see around the world. And they would have this symbol of either the eagle uh, or a serpent on there. And then that brought me to the study of the, the double helix symbol and where the origins of that came from. And that always led me back to the same, no matter who I was studying, and then I, I found your book and you were doing the same thing, is it always uh, came back to the Emerald Tablets and the story of Enlil and Enki. Uh, so can, yeah. can you... Yeah, go ahead and share a little bit about that. You know, did you, is that how you did it? You started following these uh, symbols and flags and all this stuff, and then it led you all the way back to Enlil and Enki? Yeah, I was um, studying the ancient civilizations. The first thing that really popped up was noticing this certain symbolism that's shared by ancient cultures all around the world. I mean, if you go to the, the Mayas, the Mayan civilization was basically their god was Kukulkan. And Kukulkan was one of these serpent dragon gods. And then if you head just a little further southwest, you get into the Aztec, who had this serpent dragon god called Quetzalcoatl. You know, how is that just a coincidence? And then you get down into South America, and you start getting into Viracocha. And then you go across the world, and, you, you know, you find that the ancient Egyptians used the symbol of the serpent to represent knowledge on their forehead. That's what, that's what the ancient pharaohs had. And then you go up into... Up, right up into um, essentially India, and you find this serpent and eagle symbolism that's just all over the place. It's, it's covering, and of course Mesopotamia with the eagle and the serpent symbolism, you see you see through and throughout murals everywhere um, in that ancient land. And I, just on the ancient perspective side, started to really notice that. And I, I'm not the first one to come up with that, but we have to remember that the the serpent has been this demonized evil figure throughout history, and the eagle has been this symbol of freedom, sovereignty, and, and good. And we've had that brainwashed into us for so long, thousands of years, that's been this inverted truth. And a lot of people, you know, scratch their head and wonder about that because you brought up a good point about this double helix known as the caduceus medical symbol. If, if, the, if the serpent is such an e evil symbol, what is it doing on our most prestigious, you know, medical symbol representing this, you know, double helix DNA and this metamorphosis with wings at the top where humans can reach this higher state of energy and consciousness? Um, quickly, that, that sort of rolled into looking at, okay, what about more recent times? Where can we find these symbols more recent? And then throughout history, you look at the Roman Empire with the, Byz the Byzantine eagle, which is the double-headed eagle. And then you go all the way up through this, the empires, the Slavic Empire and the Spanish Empire and the Russian Empire. You, you name them over and over again. You see these empires with this symbol of the eagle. And then today, you know, still from the place that I'm calling from, you know, in the United States, we still have this eagle that's, this, you, you know, scattered all over the place. It's this, this powerful symbol. And when you start to look at how empires, that turned into warring empires almost always had the symbol of the eagle. And then civilizations that were at least based on the original acquisition of knowledge and higher consciousness 
you know, understanding the universe around them, the balance. That was, that was, those are the civilizations that had the serpent. But the, the problem is, and I know a lot of people are going to call this out right now, is the idea, well, why did all these civilizations, why are the, Ma- the Maya and Aztec practicing all this blood sacrifice? You know, is that, is that because of the serpent? And that's where the rabbit hole gets really deep when you understand that there's these different influences throughout history. And you can actually go to places like Chichen Itza and the Temple of the Jaguars, and you can see that the eagle in there with the serpent dragon surrounding it. And you really begin to understand that, oh, okay, so here's a story. Here's a story where there was influences long ago. And those influences, like you mentioned, if you follow the eagle and the serpent as far back as you can, and at least the, the persona of each side of, of what that represented, you get all the way back into Mesopotamia with what you mentioned being Enki and Enlil. And that's where, I guess, this, this ancient uh, forbidden story really starts, doesn't it? It does. And, and uh, Enki and Enlil, uh, from what most of the uh, tablets and the, uh, you know, the writings tell us, they were not from Earth. They were from somewhere else. From yeah. heaven, you know. If someone wants to try to wrap around, well, what is heaven? It, it really just simply means anywhere beyond the realm of Earth. And I, and I would even argue that includes things like higher dimensions. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. I was going to ask what you thought. Um, there was two things. I don't want to get, deviate too far, but staying on the snake for a moment, I thought it was fascinating um, that uh, even in the Bible, uh, the story, I think I'm pretty sure it's in Numbers, where Moses makes a bronze snake because the people have been bitten and by snakes. But then Moses makes a bronze snake, puts it on a pole, and then the people who, who look at the bronze snake are healed, which I thought was, to me, that's a metaphor for the same power that can hurt you is the same one that can heal you. So I mean, I don't take it, you know, I mean, for me, I thought that was literal. But what's your, what was, A, what was your take on it? Because that's still, you, you think that the Bible always has, uh, like you said, in modern times, we always think the, the Bible would be an iconic book that always depicts the serpent as evil, but it doesn't. <laughs> you know, we have to sometimes look underneath and dig deeper and say, you know, they, the serpent in and of itself isn't evil. It's the way it's used in the story. And then the power of it is that it's, du- it's duality. The other thing, I was going to ask your, your opinion about that. And if you think there's any more recent, um, I would say recent ancient texts that have that duality to the, the positive and negative of the snake. Uh, besides the one I alluded to, your comment be on that one. And then I wanted to ask you a little bit about what what philosophy you think is driving, um, or I'd say the, the, the philosophy of radical skepticism that tries to uh, undercut the kind of things you're teaching. And in particular, I know that you're, uh, you like a lot of the Platonic writings, and obviously Plato was one of the most, uh, this is two questions, so I know this is getting long. I wanted to see if you could, could touch on both of these. That that uh, he he's a, a you know everything's a footnote to Plato and philosophy. But he also talked about Atlantis, and you've mentioned that, and I've listened to some of the other interviews you've done and things like that. But why do you think I'm trying to come at it from a different angle? Wh- what is the philosophy behind the radical skepticism that will accept almost everything that Plato had to say, but not the story about Atlantis? I, I, okay. You don't even. So that, those are what two pretty that? loaded questions, but they're they're related in some way because when we trace back these biblical stories, many of them, not all of them, but many of them came from Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets, and we know that especially with the story of Atrahasis, which was the the, all the story that was also echoed in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and that was the idea that there's you know there was this great catastrophe on the earth. And there were some individuals that were special, have special individuals, bloodlines, who were warned. And they were warned about the catastrophe, and they survived. And that story is echoed throughout the Mes- several Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets. But strangely, when it reaches in, into the whole biblical context, the names are all changed, the story is completely changed, and all of a sudden it becomes so fantastic and impossible that people, oh, okay, they all of a sudden except the idea that every one of these stories is just simply a myth, and it's trying to teach us a lesson. They're saying they, so they, that's the perception, is that every story is just a myth, doesn't have any basis in truth, but the purpose of it is just to teach us a lesson about something. And that's how it's remained for a long time. And you brought up other biblical stories as well. 
I believe all of those are symbolic stories that go back to a much earlier time. And the pure forms of those were either lost or they were in many ways manipulated and rewritten. You know, we find we find many occasions. So, so uh, getting back to what I was saying before about that story, the, like the flood account, you know, the biblical story, he's called Noah, that the individual that survives the story. But that's not the name that's used in any other cuneiform tablets. Why did they use that name? Because if you go read the Atrahasis and you read the Epic of Gilgamesh, it clearly states these, these names that are used, but then they're never carried over. To me, that was done as a way to deceive and not allow people to track back and find the truth of these stories. Because I think the danger was that if we realized that a lot of these ancient stories had merit in truth in some aspects, then it would open the floodgates, you know, as I was not to make a pun there, but it would open the floodgates basically for for all of this knowledge of the past to be looked at in a completely different way. You know, when you look at stories like the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it mentions the city of Uruk, well, that was a real city. So wait a minute. So why are we being told that the whole thing is a myth when we actually know that these cities were real and they, they specifically state dimensions, how big they were, where they were located right along the, it says right in the, in the tablet, it says that it was located right along the Euphrates River. And yet, and we read stories like the Adrahasis, which gives us specific details about other cities like Sharupak and how Noah's real name was Adrahasis or Zayasudra. Or in the Epic of Gilgamesh, she was even called Untapishti. So we get all these different names, we get all these different cities, and we get all this information in these ancient tablets that gets somewhat carried over into biblical records. But it's very um, polluted at that point. A lot of it's been rewritten for certain agendas, certain, certain powerful agendas and perspectives, and we can trace all of that back to the forming of the merging and forming of the, Rome, the, the Holy Roman Empire, which was the same empire that had the mighty Byzantine eagle, which means, essentially means, ultimate power and control over, over, over everywhere, dominion, because the, the double-headed eagle essentially represents seeing both sides, both ways, not both sides as in positive and negative, but, but being able to basically observe and, and know everything that's going on. And that was the, the Roman Empire. And when, so when the Roman Empire was collapsing, they, they got pretty intelligent. They realized that, hey, why don't we just take spirituality and turn it into this powerful religion? We can, we can control the narrative. And then at the same time, we can just march around and destroy all these ancient cuneiform libraries and Gnostic libraries. And if we can eradicate this message of the past, we can just rewrite the whole narrative. And that's exactly what they did. And so yeah. now when we're, when we're reading these cuneiform tablets, they're, sim- they're simply all that remain of this forbidden past that has been manipulated and turned into these biblical stories that people don't even think is real or real. Yeah, and I, and I, I always had a hard time with the Noah's Ark story. Uh, there's no way you're going to build a boat and put every single animal, two of each, on the boat and not have mass <laughs> mass hysteria or mass killings and the uh, god-awful smell of what would be in that boat. I mean, uh, I, I always had a problem with the way that one was written. And I, um, I think this is what pro- might have happened as well. And you did mention the Romans, and the Romans... Uh, they were probably the worst out of all of them because when they ransacked like the Alexandrian library, uh, they took everything out of it, burned it to the ground, and then they probably a lot of that stuff is inside those Vatican vaults that they talk about. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Yep. And they took all of the knowledge and they said, okay, you know, if we're really going to hold back humans from reaching that higher consciousness, uh, you know, we, we, could, we could lay out a religion here where people will feel like they're sinners constantly or they're not doing something right, and they'll always stay at a lower level of uh, you know, spirituality or, or consciousness. But, um, you know, it, it's, the stories, they do, they just keep coming, like you study the Egyptian story, and then, you know, we didn't talk about the Greeks. Like, so here's the symbol of Zeus, and here's the symbol yeah. of Poseidon, right? So then yeah. again, you have the original Mesopotamian story of Enlil and Anki, two brothers, right? And the yes. one brother 
they basically sent Poseidon out to the seas with his pitchfork, right? And he becomes our modern day Satan, right? Uh, yeah, because it was actually called the trident. But they, but see, trident, yeah. so much of our history has been inverted. So they took the trident and they inverted it to become the pitchfork. That's how that whole thing went. Yeah. Yeah, and he was the symbol of the serpent. He was the one that That's was right. kind to the creation. Because I believe the Garden of Eden was actually in Sumeria. I, you know, to go from Neanderthal human overnight to Homo sapien human, I mean, there was definitely some type of a breeding from uh, some type of an alien uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. That's what I believe. And that's what they did in the Garden of Eden. So if it was in Sumeria, if I am right, then all these stories that come out about the creationism in Garden of Eden come out of that story. And then was it the Enlil and Enki were the ones that were going to guide the civilizations and teach the people how to you know, build and take care of themselves? Is that pretty much what happened? Yeah, so I guess I could give a brief history of, of that. It might, might help people. So um, now this might seem like a story that just comes right out of, you know, some people have come up with the conclusion that researchers like Zechariah Sitchin created this entire story and that none of it's real. And I want to put a firm line in the sand to really just give a little background to blow that whole um, false scenario out of the water. So in, um, in the 1800s, um, there was a, a famous library that few have ever heard of called the Ashurbanipal Library, and it was founded in Nineveh, Iraq, by Henry Austin Layard, okay? And in those, those tablets were found in this buried library under the ground, and they found all these cuneiform tablets from Mesopotamia, and they hauled them all back to the University of Oxford, and nobody knew how to read them. Well, in 1875, there was an Assyriologist named um, George Smith, and he came along, and he was one of the premier Assyriologist experts in the world. And he was, we got to understand, just to backpedal just a second, um, the language of Sumer, the language that was being used during the ancient Sumerian time with when you're looking at places like uh, the civilizations that emerged later, like Akkadia. The Akkadian civilization was the ones that first stopped using this ancient cuneiform writing. Okay, so, and that's an ancient civilization, too. So what you find, if you understand that, is basically this ancient cuneiform language died out. And for thousands of years, very few people could ever speak it. And so once these tablets were found, it was, it was, they just sat there until George Smith came along in 1875, though. This is not a recent thing. So George Smith finds these tablets, and he starts reading them and translating them, and he could not believe what he's found what he was reading. He starts, it's reported that he starts running around the room to hollering and screaming because he realized what I try to tell people all along was that here we have literally the oldest records of human history, the oldest records that have ever been preserved of what actually occurred in the past. And those records, what they found in that library are famous tablets like the Atrahasis, okay, and things like the Epic of Gilgamesh and, and many, many others were found in, these, in this library and, and so subsequent other libraries that were found later in other ancient cities. And these stories, it's not like one thing is mentioned somewhere and then we never see it again. This, these, these names that we find, Enki, Enlil, also, Enki was also known as Ea, and there's some other variations as well, but we find those names all throughout these cuneiform tablets. It was their obsession. These gods, as they call them, were basically the great story of that they wanted to write about because they felt like it was so important that it encapsulated all of our, essentially our origin story and our history. And what they say in at least half a dozen of these tablets from the epic of um, Eridu Genesis to the Atrahasis to the, um, to the legend of Atania, they describe these events that occurred in the past with this lowering of kingship and this creation of, of civilization. And they mention specifically in places like the Eridu Genesis and the Sumerian King List, they say very, very clearly that Eridu was the first city ever created on Earth. And then they go to list all of these other cities that were then ruled um, over thousands of years later. And those cities that are mentioned in places like the Sumerian King List can then be verified in all these other tablets. 
So you're reading the Adrahasis, and you're like, oh my God, there's the there's he was the king of Shrupak. Okay, so I'll grab the Sumerian king list. Okay, so Shrupak was the last city on that tablet before the floods destroyed everything. So then you start to be able to piece together to understand, wow, so this wasn't just a myth. A lot of these stories are actually historical accounts of what happened. And what they all state, and this isn't just one tablet, they essentially all carry over the same message. From the Enuma Elish to the Atrahasis to the Eridu Genesis, they state that early on, long ago, the earth was once completely balanced. All of life was balanced here. And these beings descended and came here, and they decided to create their own reality here. And they quickly realized that they state that they were toiling in this, in this reality, and, it was, and they had these lower, uh, you could call them lower royal beings called the Ajiji, which are, which are called in the Book of Enoch, the Watchers. And they state that they were the ones who were here, and they were trying to maintain our world, the infrastructure of our world, not digging for gold but maintaining our world. And why would you have to do that? Well, if anybody knows about agriculture, if you're in a place where you're in a more, a little bit more of an arid location, like in the, Mes- in the Mesopotamian Fertile Crescent, and you have these incredible rivers, though, that are feeding from the northern mountains, the Euphrates and the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. If you don't do anything on those rivers at all, if you just leave them alone, they will fill up with silt and, be, and you, you no longer can really use them for agriculture and, and feeding the land because you haven't maintained them. And that's exactly what it says in the Atrahasis. It says that the Ajiji had to maintain the river channels, the lifelines, they call, of the land, and that they eventually revolted. They didn't want to do that any longer. They said it was grueling work, and they had this huge revolt. And according to the Atrahasis, they stormed Enlil's um, location he was in. Essentially, it was like a, like a, almost like a castle. It was like a structure, and they stormed it, and they demanded that they have relief. And they, they summoned all the gods, and they, these different gods from different locations that they had been designated to rule our reality. They came together, and they decided on creating mankind in their image, just like Genesis says, yeah. creating their image. And so they created this man who could, it was called man. It wasn't just a male, but it was called man, mankind. And they created it in their image to what they called toil for the gods. And, but the problem became that these two brothers, known as en- Enki and Enlil, they had these vastly different opinions for how human civilization should be run. You know, en- Enki wanted human civilizations to be highly conscious and more of an advanced being. And Enlil just wanted them to just take orders and be, you know, like almost like working slaves, right. if you yeah, could call them that. And then the problem became that, and you see this story echoed all throughout um, ancient cultures, like the Greeks, with the story of Poseidon and Zeus and Prometheus, you know, helping humanity. And then you look at the story of Prometheus. He is banished by Zeus to have a, an eagle basically peck at his liver because he, he decided to help humanity out, give them fire and knowledge. And so those stories are echoed all throughout cultures, this struggle this struggle over how human civilizations should run and how conscious they should become. And that struggle became the struggle of the eagle and the serpent because the eagle all represented the Lord of the air. And if you break down the name Enlil, it means E-N meant Lord and L-I-L meant the sky or air. And so his name literally means Lord of the air or Lord of the sky. And he became contr- his, his designation. See, they, when they, they came here, they, re- they decided that they would literally take over every aspect of our reality. And as mind-boggling as that is for us to consider, we, we find out in stories like The Legend of Atanya, where it has this symbolic story of this, the eagle and the serpent and how the eagle betrays the serpent. Okay? And in that, it's, it states basically what all these other tablets said. It says that Enki was forced to rule in the underworld. That was, he was forced to rule in the underworld and which means he was, he was tasked with maintaining balance. And Enlil was, it was said that he was going to rule the material world and that, the, that, that mankind was, were essentially like his people. And that's yeah, how this yeah, whole thing went. Just like the story of Poseidon. I mean, it, it, it almost exact. Almost yeah, exact. and that's why those stories carried over to all those cultures, because it was so important. 
it was such a symbolic story. All right, we're coming up on the break, everyone. Uh, sit tight. We're going to go to a commercial break. We have Matt Lee, uh, Matthew LaCroix with us here on the show, and you are listening to the One World Government Podcast Hour. To the One World Government Podcast Hour. And yes, you are listening to the One World Government Podcast Hour. My name's Paul Barrett. I'm with my co host, James Linton. And we have the incredible Matthew LaCroix with us here today, world renowned author, talk show, and podcast host, public speaker. He's out there uh, with the research that he's accumulated over a long time, and he's really uh, touching a lot of people and getting a lot of people uh, you know, uh, who may have been on the fence uh, thinking about some things about our ancient history and ancient civilizations that they uh, just didn't add up. And I think that's what a lot of us uh, are getting to the point uh, here today. And Jim, I think you had a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask Matt if we could jump back um, quickly. Uh, you did a great job of explaining how some ancient um, power structures, political structures, uh, sort of tainted ancient texts, and, and there was a method behind that. I was wondering if you could expound a little bit upon what you think is happening. Uh, the best way I could articulate it is modern scientism, which would readily accept the, the wisdom philosophy of, of uh, Plato, but then immediately reject all of the writings about Atlantis and, and why that is and what that power structure is about. That's a great question. Um, and that's something that I touch on quite, quite often because it is quite amazing to me that when you look at someone like Plato, you know, revered as one of the greatest um, incorporators of this ancient philosophy aspect that began with Socrates and then, you know, we based a lot of morals on and certain lessons and, and understanding, you know, human psychology and consciousness. You know, he's revered as this, as this incredible um, figure. Yet, even with all of that um, being revered, these, these aspects of his writings are completely ignored. And I, I find that to be rather amazing. And I think that, that really plays on a much bigger problem that encompasses so much of this of this aspect of lo looking at ancient writings and ancient history and trying to figure out well what's real what's you know just a symbolic metaphorical way to look at something and what is maybe a deception and i think that those lines have become very blurred because when we look at someone like plato um he gives us this idea of all these important um philosophy viewpoints and all this stuff and everyone's like wow that's amazing but then would they read something like the Timaeus and Critias? And he's talking about this ancient civilization called Atlantis that once existed. He says, southwest of the Pillars of Hercules, right? And so people, mm -hmm. we, we stop and we say, well, wait, wait, so that's, that's not real, right? But then everything else he said is real. Why do we do that? Well, there's been this very, very tightly guarded narrative that has, as I said, has been controlled for a very long time and it may it may be a lot more powerful than most people realize. And they create this, this idea where certain things are accepted and ac modern academics accept them readily and are, and are free to discuss them and talk about them. And then there's these areas that are completely forbidden, completely forbidden. And anyone that's a, an academic that spends their whole life trying to get accreditation and these, um, you know, higher learning degrees, they have, they put their entire, um, past in jeopardy just because they they might want to speak about some of these forbidden topics no most of them won't just because they're not going to you know essentially what they would consider as ruin their whole their whole career and because if you were to bring that up so let's just say you're a mainstream academic and you all of a sudden come out on your spokesman you know mike and you say um plato was right about atlantis it really existed and we should really look into what he was saying that person would get completely laughed at and they would be ridiculed and they would get essentially kicked out of that, this group, right? This academic group yep. of experts that have defined essentially everything in our reality for us. Now, 
and that's where the problem came in. If you remember what I was talking about before, a lot of these very, very important ancient symbols and stories have been completely inverted to their opposite meaning. You know, when we look at heroes throughout history that we perceive as heroes, like Columbus, we all of a sudden realize there's a completely different side of that if we look at a, a different kind of perspective. And that's the way that this, this is starting to evolve. And so I think that old guard narrative to control this, this perception of the past is starting to break down crumbling now um, all around us, especially people that are online and spending time listening to shows like this, they're starting to see some of these holes that exist. And those holes tell us that there's an entire lost past to our, to our story that is, is very much being suppressed and hidden. And that's, of course, another area where a lot of people will roll their eyes is the idea of a conspiracy and that this is a deliberate thing to hide this stuff. But the more you look at it, the more you look at the means that have gone into it and how important all this is, to me, it, it couldn't be more clear that all of this has been very hidden because Plato tells us that this ancient civilization, Atlantis, which he found out about through Solon, who got that through Egypt, ancient Egypt, this story talks about how in Plato verifies that this ancient civilization was destroyed um, around 11,500 years ago, 11,600 years ago. And that same date is what we find in ice core samples from Greenland that show us that there was a climate disaster during that time period. You know, it was the Younger Dryas, where all of these ice caps around the planet all simultaneously melted. And there was all kinds of um, cataclysms occurring on the Earth, not just with that, but great floods and destructive tectonic activity, volcanoes and huge climate shifts. And that those events can be verified. And we, and we see the, the disappearance of megafauna, like Randall Carlson says, all over yeah. the northern, northern hemisphere. And so that, to me, it, when, when there's information that is deliberately trying to be pushed and suppressed to the, to the, to the, for, the background, then that's probably what the truth is. I, I agree. And, uh, you know, look at the current state of the world. You know, I, I go, I'm able to go on retreats and get away from everything for a couple of days. And then I come back and I visually see what's going on in our current world and just uh, not just the, uh, the anger of the people, but the politics. Uh, you always have two parties fighting each other and then, uh, you know, the violence. Uh, you know, just look at, uh, we have grandkids running around, so just look at these uh, video games and th that they play everything you're shooting at people, killing people. Um, Everything, there's this continuum, like you said, the old guard, there's of uh, constant confrontation, constant fighting. Uh, turn on a TV show at night. Some guy's chasing another guy with a gun, right? They're shooting at everybody. It's, yeah. it's like this whole, if it is a Plato scenario uh, or a play that was put before us, we have all the wars we want. We have all the corporate greed we want. We're invading countries for their oil and their natural gas. We got symbols of eagles on the flags while we do it. It's it's all this whole stage, this whole play has been set up already, and it's you know it's it, maybe it is what it really is supposed to be, especially if if Enlil is really Yahweh in the Bible. Yeah. Right. So maybe maybe we. Maybe we were totally duped and tricked to stay away from Enki, because maybe he was supposed to be the evil one and all this other stuff, according to the age of things, and we fell into the wrong, the wrong side, and now we're all suffering from it. You know, just like Buddha. Exactly. You know, Buddha, Buddha sat under the tree. Why do people suffer? Why is there so much suffering in such a, a beautiful world that we could have? And I, I wanted to ask you that. You know, we had these great, you know, Jesus Christ, Buddha, Gandhi, we've had these great spiritual teachers come along. What what part do you think they played in all of this? I think that that is just a way for us to say, look, if you are able to follow a certain path and acquire a certain amount of knowledge and reach physical health and balance and, you know, helping everyone around you and trying to achieve all these things to further and better our, our, you know, human experience here and our own conscious evolution. I think that there are real, real tangible things that happen. Things like 
raising your vibrational frequency and reaching a higher state. And I think that's been the goal all along. And I think that was the great purpose behind why the Holy, the Holy Roman Empire became what it is. And then religion largely became, became corrupted. And like you said, this figure, this Yahweh, Jehovah figure that, you know, we we have been brainwashed to think is good, but really, if you start reading about it, it's it's not really a good figure at all. It's 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 sort of a wicked yeah. figure that wants to control humanity and have us in this little box of, of perception. And I think what you said is dead on. I think we have been duped and tricked here to follow the opposite of what we should. And instead of becoming balanced and reaching higher states of consciousness, we became focused and obsessed with the material world and fighting in constant wars and being ruled through this idea of fear where every single thing in our society is designed around fear to condition society to accept that as being normal. You know, you look at the Roman Empire when they were conquering countries all around the world and they were collapsing from being unsustainable. What did they do to distract the, distract the people? They just had these huge gladiator games where the focus was just on murder and killing. And, and if you if anyone's seen, I'm sure they have seen movies where where the, the crowd is is reacting in certain ways. In in most cases, it's like the crowd in in all these cases in these scenarios is so conditioned towards blood and violence that they want that. They actually scream for it. And, you know, someone look at the iconic idea of you know someone who comes up with alternate ideas way back in medieval times, and they're trying to change perspectives. And they get burned alive at the stake or stoned. Those individuals are um, the citizens that are there. Are they're not supporting a you know some kind of a fair trial or oh maybe this individual has got good ideas? No, they're the ones screaming to have that person killed. Why? Because they've been conditioned for so long into becoming like like you said those guards of the system. There they become the guards of the system that doesn't do them any justice keeps them living in, in misery and fear, and they don't even realize that they're the ones perpetuating this, this very, very sick system that keeps us basically in our lowest state possible. If you look at this internal system that's within our body below our spinal cord, the ancient in, the Indus Valley civilizations talked about it all the time in their, ancient, in their ancient writings. We have these chakra centers that are basically energy centers of the body. Because really what we are is just this energetic projection of our consciousness. And we are, the purpose here is to learn valuable lessons and reach a higher state. And that was, that's what's being protected and being hidden was this manual for how to reach your highest state and become aware and conscious. That's what this whole game has been about, to corral humanity and control them in this completely false paradigm of reality, and they make them think that that's what they really are. Like the idea that we're this Darwinian idea that we're just an evolved ape and that's all we are, and that so that the idea of survival of the fittest, it's it's fine. We because yeah. we got here through fighting and being the best, but really that entire perspective is incorrect and has been a deception. And the cycle of rebirth uh, keeps going on. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, I I I wasn't trying to jump in. Go ahead. Oh, okay. You're good. You're good. Hey, uh, Matthew, I want to touch on Toth, the legend of Toth, uh, the halls of Amenti. Uh, fabulous work, you and uh, Billy Carson. I heard you guys talking about it. Could you share like a little little synopsis of what that was? Sure. So now there are people out there that um, are trying to really push the idea that the emerald tablets aren't real and that only the, the emerald hermetic tablet is correct and all these things. And I want to just provide a little bit of history behind that and a little bit of knowledge on, on this, this war of over information that's been going on for thousands of years. So like, like Plato said, there was an ancient civilization that was part of some of these global connected civilizations called Atlantis. And Atlantis was destroyed during some of these cataclysms. Well, before it was destroyed, According to these records, like what I'm about to go over, when Atlantis was going, to be, was going to be destroyed, there was a priest, an ancient priest named Thoth, who also goes by names like, like you mentioned. There's a, it, actually, there's a, quite a few variations for how to say his sure. name. Sure. Um, and so Thoth was this ancient Atlantean priest, and he took his trusted priests around him 
individuals that were part of his collective group, and they decided that the most important thing to do, knowing that this Atlantis and this ancient civilization structure they had been created was going to destroy it. And so what they did is they, they went to Egypt and founded the civilization there called Kem or Al-Kem. And that's where the word alchemy came from, because Thoth was a master alchemist. He had, he had mastered the idea of how, he'd, how to manipulate energy and how to combine certain elements. And, they, and it's reported that he had achieved understanding how to find immortality. Through, through taking, essentially, going into these periods of rest and then reawakening. I mean, how many times have we seen that in ancient Egypt? You know, this idea of going into a coffin, going into some kind of a chamber where you can rejuvenate yourself and then come back out again. That, was, that came from Thoth and, and through the master of alchemy and the mastering of the nature of reality. So Thoth basically took the wisdom Atlantis and he wrote it down. But he was really smart. He wrote it down on, created these alchemical um, tablets that are reportedly indestructible. And the idea was that he knew that this war and information existed. And, and they basically did this to, as a way to, to protect all this, this legacy of knowledge. And they stored those ancient writings in the Great Pyramid of Giza. Okay, and so he mentions these halls of Amente and this, uh, this great library that once existed down there. And they, if you today, if you look at what he said about the Great Pyramid of Giza and how the Sphinx was this, this, this lion guardian, this guardian that, that guarded the entrance to the halls of Amente and these great libraries of knowledge underneath the earth. And to this day, if you go, and, and if anyone's not familiar with this, it's incredible if you actually look at it. Go look at pictures of the Sphinx, okay? Go look at the head and go look underneath along the sides. You'll, you just look up, you know, hidden chambers of the Sphinx or whatever, and you'll see, clear as day, there's all these entrances, these secret entrances in, at the Sphinx and other tombs nearby, like the Tomb of the Birds, that their purpose are these literal entryways into what they call the underworld, which is basically underneath the ground, underneath into the energies of the earth. And... Those areas are, have been completely boarded off and, and hidden from society. In some, in some cases, the entrance to the next in front of the paw of the Sphinx was boarded over. So you can't even, you can't even get to it anymore. So if some people don't think, think that I'm you know, full of whatever, go look this up and you'll find images of these tunnels. Some people have gone down into them. Um, Zahi Hawass, who is this gatekeeper of Egyptian knowledge, this, you know, protector of this, the old guard narrative, there's even, there's even pictures showing him going down these staircases, these long tunnels that disappear into the darkness, and then they say there's nothing down there. Whereas these ancient records, like in, in um, the Emerald Tablets, state that that was tunnels that lead down into these incredible libraries and these places where they had built. And so these things are being hidden. And so that, the reason I bring that up is that you can see that that's already this, this conspiracy suppression of this information because they don't want people to know about it. So at the same time, the Emerald Tablets, like a lot of these other ancient writings, was being sought for destruction. And so there were secret societies all throughout history, and some of them were good and some of them were bad. And some of the bad ones have taken over and controlled our entire world. And that's how it went. Go look at JFK's, one of his last speeches that he gave, talking about how he knew about these ruthless conspiracy with these secret societies that had essentially were like controlled our world through shadow and how they stay, stay in the background. He said that right before he was killed, right before he was killed. And so that gets into leading into the Emerald Tablets. Well, the Emerald Tablets was one of these pieces of information that contained so much about how to achieve your highest state, the nature of reality, the wisdom of Atlantis and what happened long ago. It's all there, and I included many of those, the most important Emerald Tablet translations in the stage of time. But, what he, but essentially what happened was these secret societies that had to carry on after some of these benevolent ones had to protect this. And so they had to guard its location, and that location has been kept secret. It's been moved around a couple different times throughout history. Once. It was, take, it, was, it was once taken to um, 
in uh, in Mexico to the Aztec um, to Teotihuacan, and under the pyramid of uh, one of the pyramids of the sun, and or it, the pyramid of the moon, pyramid of the sun. We don't really know, but what we do know is that that's information that has been tightly guarded and and and, um, and protected by certain individuals. At the same time, others have demonized it. So, because they want no, they they don't want people to even think that there could be any truth in it. Because once you read them, once you read those ta- those the Emerald Tablets, you'll you'll never see reality the same way again. Got it, Matthew Lacroix. I, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, would you come back on the show again sometime in the future? I would love to. You guys have been great. I really enjoyed our discussion. Thank you. Yep, yep. And his You're book, welcome. Stage of Time, is out there, available everywhere. Just look for it. Or, Matthew, where can they find you on YouTube? Okay, so you can find me on YouTube at Matthew LaCroix, and that's L-A-C-R-O-I-X. And I also have a website called thestageoftime.com that I have all these links and translations and a place for people to come to actually find some of this unpolluted knowledge. Incredible. All right. All right, everyone, for uh, my great co-host, James Linton, my name is Paul Barrett, and you have listened to the nearly famous One World Government Podcast Hour.